Hello and welcome to a special episode of To The Point. Two months into demonetization, my guest is one of the world's most renowned and highly regarded economists to discuss the aims and achievements of demonetization as well as its consequences, both those that were intended as well as those that were not intended. And if you haven't guessed, my guest is a professor at Harvard University, a former master of Trinity College at Cambridge, and a Nobel Prize winning economist, Amartya Sen. Professor Sen, Exactly two months after demonetization was announced, and now that you've had a chance to spend time in India and to see the impact on the country for yourself, what's your view of this step? Was it a wise decision or a mistake? Oh, it certainly wasn't a wise decision. And yes, it was a mistake. Uh, how gigantic a mistake we have, we can discuss. Um, but it certainly is a mistake both in terms of its um, its objective of uh, dealing away with corruption as well as the objective of one rapid jump getting into a cashless economy. Let's then explore that answer and in the first instance let me point out demonetization was intended as a means of eliminating black money but all the surveys suggest that only six percent of black money is held in cash the rest is in real estate, gold, jewelry or stocks. Now, and foreign accounts. And foreign accounts. Is it therefore worth demonetizing 86% of all currency to tackle 6% black money? Well, that was the puzzling aspect because these, uh, these statistics from the former statistical advisor like from the Sen and so on were known to everyone, must have been known to the Prime Minister as well. So if it's only 6 or 7% of black money is in cash, how do you expect to have a major victory over black money by just dealing with that tiny proportion? So it's been puzzling. Um, I don't really know how people's minds work, uh, but of course what has happened is that as it became clear that it wasn't achieving uh, what was meant to achieve, uh, then the objective seemed to be redefined and suddenly we are told that it it's cashless economy, that's what we want. In fact, I'll come to all the objectives one by one, but let's for a moment stick to the initial objective, which was to eliminate black money. If I understand you correctly, you're saying it's puzzling that the government opted to eliminate 6% black money held in cash by eliminating 86% of all currency altogether. That is a disproportionate way of tackling a small problem. Yes, and uh, well, there are two further, I, I, I agree with that, but there are two further problems. One is not at all clear that it would, even though 6 or 7 percent, it will deal with it. And as the statistics come in, even though they are not officially confirmed as to how much money has got back without there being much penalty, uh, even that 6 or 7 percent, it wasn't ideally aimed to deal with that. But on top of that, the uh, impact is the 86 percent is certainly, as you say, it's a very big proportion. But the dependence of, of it, of a, any kind of early economic um, transition economy like India or Britain in, in from mid, uh, mid, uh, well, mid, mid 19th century, let's say, when the dependence on cash is extremely central to the new industrialization that's taking place in textile, this, that, another. And so its impact, that it would have a major impact on the economy, should have been clear on the basis of historical understanding. And so there was this puzzling feature, why? Why is such a small proportion being attacked? Why in a way that wouldn't likely to succeed within that? And why it would have such a do something which would have such a major impact on, on the society and the economy. Now you alluded to statistics about the amount of money that is coming back. Both Bloomberg a few days ago as well as the Business Standard have reported that as much as 97% of the 15.4 lakh crore demonetized on November the 8th has come back into the system by December the 30th. If those reports turn out to be correct, and I'll just point out that on this program PN Vijay a BJP spokesman has actually said the reports are correct. Okay, so if they yeah. turn out to be correct, what does that suggest about demonetization? Well, it suggests that uh, whatever else it may achieve, uh, it's not going in the way that was we were told it will go. 
in eliminating black money. It's failed, in other words. Uh, I think uh, that would be a good summary. <laughs> but uh, yes, indeed, indeed so. But uh, I, don't, I don't know these figures myself, whether that's correct or not. Uh, you say somebody from the BJP has confirmed. P and Vijay on this program on Friday evening. Yeah, but of course, uh, it wasn't only a BJP uh, program. It was basically Prime Minister Modi's uh, uh, policy. So I'm not certain whether one must take that as an, as an acceptance of the author. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Professor Sen. The uh, government has not accepted the 97% figure. Yeah, the government yeah. is, in fact, insisting yeah. that there could be what they call double counting, and they've asked the yeah. RBI to recheck. And, and, and there, may, there might well be, but even if 85% had come back, not 90 was the way you said, uh, that would still indicate it's a very small success and to the extent that it is a success at all. This leads to two quick questions mm. that arise out of the possibility that perhaps as much as 97% has come back. Within 24 or 36 hours of Bloomberg making this claim, the RBI reversed and contradicted an assurance given by the Prime Minister in November that Indians could continue to deposit old notes via the RBI yeah. till the 31st of March. Suddenly, the RBI decided no more deposit of old notes except by NRIs. Now, not only did that deeply embarrass the government, but some people began to speculate this had been done because the government was now scared that more money would return than had actually been demonetized. 15.4 lakh crore was demonetized. They were scared we might end up with more than 15.4 lakh <laughs> coming back. Yeah. How do you view the RBI's decision to suddenly counter and contradict the Prime Minister's position? I don't think it, it is RBI's decision. This must be the Prime Minister's later position. I don't think the RBI decides anything at this time. I mean, when we had a really powerful uh, RBI governor, uh, namely Raghuram Rajan, one of the real luminaries in financial economics in the world, I think it's possible for RBI to have taken the independent decision to some extent. So in but, this instance, you're suggesting the RBI was acting as, how shall I put it, his master's voice? Well, yes, but that's not, uh, that doesn't worry me. The RBI, I mean, the central banks in some countries have independent, like in Italy it does, in some other countries it doesn't. And uh, it won't worry me deeply if it did not have any independent voice at all. Now the but, second follow-up question uh, mm. to the possibility that 97% has come back is that 40 days after demonetization was announced, and remember demonetization was intended to eliminate black money, on the 16th of December, the government suddenly announced a new amnesty scheme for black money, yeah. which will continue to the 31st of March. So does the new amnesty scheme for black money suggest that the government is beginning to suspect that demonetization may not work and therefore they need another strategy? Yeah, I, I, I think that must be the right reading. Um, everything I've read indicates that that must be the way the thinking is evolving. I mean, it's evolving mainly, of course, to change the corruption story into the the, uh, the excellence of a cashless economy. Absolutely. <laughs> but I'm sticking to the corruption story for a moment. Yes, yeah, sure. So we have, in our conversation, suggested, we may not have established it, but we've suggested, A, the RBI's decision to suddenly stop deposit of notes, even through the RBI, was one that actually the government had made the RBI take. It wasn't the RBI on its own. And secondly, the announcement of a new amnesty scheme yeah. is the government recognizing that perhaps the demonetization hasn't worked. Both of those are, are steps being taken by the government, in a sense, to cover its, forgive my colloquialism, backside. Um, yes, I wouldn't uh, put it quite that way, on the <laughs> other hand. Uh, yes, but you know, that again, uh, one has to be fair. I mean, if you find a mistake, then you change your policy. Uh, the, the really question remains, why did the government expect it to succeed? when on no economic ground that I can think of, one would have expected to, to, it to succeed. I'm not uh, against people, the government changing its policy when it finds that it's not working. But be honest about it. Yes, that is quite important. Let me put to you the government's counter. Mm. The government says even if all the money that was demonetized comes back into the system, yeah. we have the means A, to scrutinize accounts, yes. B, detect black money, and C, both tax and penalize it. And separately, 
The economist Surjit Bhalla has calculated in his uh, article in the Indian Express that the government could garner a windfall gain of 2.5 lakh crore in the first year and thereafter 1.5 lakh every subsequent year in perpetuity. How do you respond to that sort of analysis? I don't know what they're based on and that seems to me to be highly speculative. Uh, uh, you know, the government would obviously, to the extent that it can extract money through penalty and other means from, from those who return those money, uh, would get something, we would expect that. Uh, there's nothing surprising about that at all. But, you know, in the context of, of planning for the Indian economy, uh, and I'm not even bringing in for the welfare of Indian people, just the economy, for the moment, taking a narrow view of economics, it, it's really... It, rather small fry what we are talking about here given the size of the economy and this so gain is small fry yeah it is but on the other hand you know uh, obviously if if you uh, into a policy which is not uh, producing many good food you cling to any food that it does produce if it looks at all edible or not so I think so they're trying to make the best of a bad job uh, I would think that probably right. That again, I don't blame them for that. That's what the government very often do. Let me put you two questions that occur to the Indian people. Because uh -huh. when the Indian people were told that this demonetized exercise will eliminate black money, uh -huh. I want to ask you a blunt question. Do you believe at the end of demonetization, black money will have been eliminated? Or do you believe because the reasons and incentives for creating black money continue, therefore the creation of black money will continue as well? Yes, because any of the radical steps that would have been needed to eliminate black money haven't been taken. I mean, by just removing a certain currency from the exchange uh, system, uh, when that uh, currency accommodates 6 or 7 percent of the total amount of black money, it's not going to produce the kind of result that was being uh, promised or expected. I don't know how it could have been expected, but evidently was expected. So uh, there's a puzzling feature <laughs> in that which I, I, I boggles the mind to, to so, some extent. Yeah. Uh. So if the curse of black money will not be eliminated and black money will continue to be generated and created, what does this mean about corruption and bribery? Will that cease well, actually, or will that continue? You know, I think to the extent that the uh, Indian people have had a great deal of patience for the suffering that's gone on, it's because people are really worried about black money and why are really worried about corruption. And so there Modi hit a sympathetic chord and he is um, getting the rewards of hitting the same In court. the sense that because people are concerned about corruption and bribery, they support what he's done about yeah, black they're money. Saying, uh, there, there are two things in, in the psychology of that, I think. One is to say, God, corruption is a big problem. We knew that this guy is trying to do something. Now, in the fact that it's uh, being done rather ham-handed way and it wouldn't achieve the result is a further thought. And I think that thought would probably come but that come, may well come well after the UP election, for but example. But you're saying a very interesting thing, Professor Sen. You're saying that because the Indian people are deeply concerned and worried about corruption and bribery, they supported Mr. Modi on black money because they hoped and prayed that the attack on demonetization would remove corruption and bribery. But if it black doesn't. money continues and corruption and bribery continue, that means at some point when people realize their hopes are dashed, they'd be deeply disillusioned. Yes, but you know, by that time, five major elections would have taken place. So you can't, I don't think, I'm not a great political thinker, but uh, even as an economist, I think one has to recognize that the timing of that recognition is going to be a lot later than what may be on the, on the top of the mind of people of the political parties right now and right here. In other words, there's a long period before people stop giving him the benefit of the doubt. He will continue to get the benefit. There is also a second element in that, because, you know, people are used to being uh, suffering, poor people in India. They've always suffered tremendously. And compared with that, the rich don't, and even those who are kind of halfway there, like you and me, don't. On the other hand, the, the idea that this is something that's hitting the relatively rich. It's something quite appealing to people. Schadenfreude. So, yeah. But on the other hand, 
it, it so happened that it's not hitting these people very much. The people are most inconvenient, and those who are who die on the line trying to get money, money out are very poor indeed. That's the paradox. Yeah, that is the paradox. Let's then at that point, because I think we've discussed the justification of demonetization in terms of eliminating black money very fully, yeah. come to the other justifications. A second justification was that, in fact, it would eliminate fake currency. Now, in the affidavit the government itself gave the Supreme Court, the government has argued that at any one point of time, the quantum of fake currency or counterfeit currency in the economy is only 400 crore. Yeah. Separately, the Minister of State for Finance has told Parliament that this figure has been constant for four years. Yeah. So my question is simple. Is it appropriate to tackle 400 crore worth of counterfeit currency by eliminating 86% of all yeah, currency? No, I think, I, think, I, I think that's really radically wrong. Uh, and I think the fake money thing, you say it's the second. The second, I would say, is, is the cashless economy. That we're still to come to that. Absolutely. I take it. The only but, reason I'm coming to it later is because Mr. Modi came up with that three weeks after demonetization yeah, happened. I think, the uh, other justifications were his initial ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm afraid that there's, if there was not much uh, reason for conviction on the first, there's far less reason for conviction on the second. The second uh, being tactical uh, counterfeit money. Yeah, because the fake money has never been a big problem in, in India. Uh, and it, it is there. And if you eliminate it, other things given, it's a good thing. On the other hand, it, it's not a major ailment of the Indian economy and not something for which um, uh, you want to hold the rest of the economy in, in a state of tension and ransom, as you said. Now, the third justification given by Mr. Modi on November the 8th, the day he announced demonetization, was that demonetization would tackle terror and, in particular, terror funding. Saturday's newspapers suggest, quoting unnamed government sources, that Maoist violence is down by 40, 50 percent. Violence in Kashmir is said to be down by 60 percent. Havala transactions have halved. The government also says that two printing presses in Pakistan, which allegedly were dedicated to, to producing counterfeit currency for India have now shut down. And Prakash Javdekar, the HRD minister, has said that a very famous Pakistani counterfeit currency racketeer has committed suicide, presumably out of frustration. If all of that is correct, would you accept that in terms of tackling terror funding, demonetization has been more effective? Well, if that, I don't know, I have no way of checking those facts. If those facts are correct, uh, that has to be a, uh, you know, it's, it's a limited success, certainly. Um, it's, not, uh, it, it's not something for which uh, threatening the lives of the majority of the poor in, in India is worth doing. On the other hand, yes, and to the extent that terror funding is reduced, uh, and, and I, I don't know this, this gentleman committing suicide in Pakistan, uh, and I don't know what the, whether the government plan is to make every Pakistani <laughs> counterfeit uh, to go into a suicide mode. Uh, whatever it is, if that happens, presumably the government would think that it is achieving something for which it should be applauded. And I can see where that argument is coming from. It's not a very big thing, I would have thought, uh, taking into account everything, and I'm sure that... But once the, again, you're suggesting they're grasping at straws because they have nothing better to claim. They're grasping, yeah, they're grasping at something which uh, they either think or they want us to think is really big. Now, I don't know, you know, these ter terrorism going down and going up. In Kashmir, we have seen ups and downs so often. Uh, and we don't quite know what's going on, what's the and reason for that. And there could be other explanations. Explanation of that. So, in terms, and I'm just summing up this part of the interview, in terms of the three initial justifications given for demonetization, that it would tackle black money, that it would tackle counterfeit currency, that it would tackle terror funding. Your feeling is, this was a disproportionately excessive way of doing these three things. There were better ways of doing it that would have been less painful and would have caused less suffering to the Indian people. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. The only thing, the, the, the third is the, the terror funding. is something where I'm taking a pass on that because I just don't know whether these numbers are correct. In the other two cases, I'm pretty certain that they haven't worked. In fact, I'm only going by yeah. what newspaper reports said on Saturday, yeah, and I'm assuming yeah. those newspaper reports are correct. They are correct, yes. 
Let's then come to the fourth justification. It was one that Mr. Modi came up with, not immediately on November the 8th when he announced demonetization, but some three weeks or four weeks later. That this was a way of pushing India yeah. towards becoming a cashless and digital economy. Yeah. Now, no doubt, that is a laudable objective. But is demonetization of 86% of currency the best or optimal way of encouraging digitalization and cashlessness? Well, it's not, because for one thing, I mean, there are a lot of debates as to how important a cashless economy is. But to the extent that, uh, you know, all, all advanced economies in America, Europe, Japan, they all have a lot of cash. Uh, but even if you accept that ultimately cashless economy would be a very good thing to have, and you can, you can, I can spell out as an economist what the argument would be, <coughs> it's still the case that it's, it's, that's not the way to do it at all. I mean, those who have advocated uh, a, a very strongly for a cashless economy, uh, like my, my colleague and a great economist, Ken Rogoff, uh, I mean, he suggested doing that over months, indeed years. And, and then, no. Not with a nuclear strike, if I can no. call and this it, a it nuclear strike. Declare, and then by the time you finish the declaration, this one year illegal. This has to be a transition for salespeople. Can change it. They have a chance of moving from one to the other, and it has had the feature, uh, if that kind of a rogue off kind of policy we're carrying out, is that it does not undermine confidence in the financial system. Whereas demonetization could have done that. It does because if even you see, if you take take an account system, we if they, uh, I mean the basic point is that a promissory note says, I promise the Reserve Bank does, I promise to pay you that. One rupee doesn't, that's just one rupee. The others are, I promise to pay a certain amount. Now, these are promises made by the government. And what the government is saying, I did promise, but I won't keep to the promise. Well, that is certainly true as of the recent decision by the RBI, which you alleged a moment ago was actually a government decision, to stop exchange of notes or deposit of old notes immediately. Suddenly, at that point, it, the promise But even earlier, open. it is that you can bring it. I'm not promising to pay it. I would examine it. And if it, you can, if the onus is on you to show that it's white, and then I might pay it. And and so, you're saying this conditionality raises moral hazards, which in, in turn uh, well, damages trust in the financial system. Yeah, and indeed, because you could do the same with accounts. You move to a cashless economy, you pay everything, and then one, day, one morning the government says, more, no transaction more than 10,000 rupees In other words, could be once done. distrust sets in, yeah. it spreads like a infection right across the system. Yeah, I mean, well, one, it, that, it's a question of whether you can take the government's word for it or not. That's very true. Let's, at this point, Professor Sen, move beyond questioning demonetization in terms of its aims and in terms of whether those aims were worth trying to secure and in the way they were secured, whether it was a disproportionate way they were secured, to what is the outcome that people have to live with. In other words, what is the impact on the economy? And there I want to start with a simple question. In a very famous speech in Parliament, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh described it as organized loot and legalized plunder. You've been in India for the last few days. You've seen the impact on the economy. Would you agree with Dr. Manmohan Singh's choice of language, or would you say that's a bit over the top? You know, I wouldn't say it's over the top because, uh, you know, when a, a poor, uh, poor person's small saving, a housewife keeping a few 500 rupee note, for, you know, uh, some purpose that will, she doesn't have to reveal even to the husband. Uh, when it comes to suddenly making them uh, open to questioning or onus is on you to show it, or strictly illegal, that actually is, is plunder. I mean, that's not one woman is not the only one. I mean, even um, people who are with whom uh, I have politically uh, relatively like Steve Forbes, for example. They I've also consider it loot and plunder. Yes, yeah, something exactly like that. <laughs> In which case, let me ask you this. What do you believe will be the hit on GDP growth? It's a question that Indians, as you know, are particularly keen to find out the answer to. Dr. Marmon Singh put it at 2%. 
A whole range of independent agencies have put it around 1%. AMBIT has gone as high as something like 3.5. From what your understanding of India, what do you think will be the hit on GDP? Problem? I don't know. And, and uh, you know, in, that, in some ways, I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it. I respect, I mean, Van Mohan is not only a friend, but also someone who, uh, who I think is a superb economist. So if he says 2%, I would tend to believe that he must have a reason for saying that. Um, I wouldn't question it, nor would I endorse it, because I just don't know. But uh, on the other hand, I think one, one part of the problem of India has been, and I've tried to write on that, is that we try to judge success by the GDP growth rate, even when the GDP growth rate is continuing without improving the lives of lots of people. I fully understand. This is just a statistic. Let's then move away but from the statistic. But, but the, the lives of people are already pretty badly affected. Let me, in fact, come to the lives yeah. of people. I want yeah. to touch, and I'll ask you to give me brief answers, yeah. on two areas where the lives of the people could be adversely affected. First, the unorganized sector, which is 45% of GDP, and within that, in particular, casual daily wage labor, which could be as much as 60% of India's workforce. How vulnerable are they? How adversely affected do you think they would be over the last two months of demonetization? I think it's pretty, pretty badly affected at, at this day and time. And the idea that he would somehow uh, eliminate, go away. I mean, GDP may, may be made up by all kinds of other things happening in the rest, uh, rest of the country. I mean, they're higher, they're relative contrary to popular perception the relatively rich have been far less affected by this. The poor so, are the ones who uh, suffer. Who have, and they don't contribute very much to GDP, but their lives depend on what, uh, what, the, what income they get. So I, wouldn't, I would think that this would be pretty badly affected. I mean, I, I just back from Santa Nikes, and I see that the potato farming, which is the second crop at this time, is, is far less, taking, taking far less. This may affect some GDP, but the big thing is that it affects the income of lots of people. So you're making, and a very employment. you're making a very important point. You're saying look at the impact of demonetization, not in terms of statistics to do with GDP, but in terms of the impact on the lives of people, particularly agricultural labor, particularly small farmers, particularly casual daily wage labor, of those who look for employment in the unorganized sector. These are people who are vulnerable. They, you're saying, will be the worst affected. Yes, indeed. And, and there are other things to look at, namely female employment, which is, India has extremely low ratio of female employment compared with the rest of the world. We are, we are tremendously peculiar in two respects. We have relatively few women workers, which makes, affects their lives of the independent of women badly. And we spend far less on health care. India does than almost any other country and in the world. And those are areas where the impact of demonetization would, would be, be quite, particularly uh, adverse. Quite, quite strong, indeed. Let me put this to you. The government's response is that the depth and extent of the suffering is going to be conditioned by the speed and effectiveness of remonetization. And this is a point that, in fact, was made in his blog on Sunday by the finance minister. A few days or weeks ago, the CEO of Niti Ayog has said, that by the end of January, 75% of what was demonetized in November will be back in the system. If he's correct, does it mean that the months of suffering will be limited to November, December, January? From February, we'll get back to normal. I think that GDP-oriented thinking. It may well be. Uh, Amman Mohan may be right that GDP won't come back there. Uh, Amman Mohan may be, uh, uh, and uh, Niti Ayo, or whoever I say, Maybe, uh, maybe right on the other side that the GDP will make up. But the jobs that are lost, I mean, the potato crop not coming, the fish market being affected. I'm referring to locally since I'm just back from Shantini Kesson and Calcutta. These are very noticeable. You go to the fish market, you see how much the trade has declined. In fact, mm. newspapers, particularly the Indian Express and the Hindu and the Business Standard as well, have had fairly graphic, although anecdotal accounts of what has happened to businesses, what has happened to employment in areas like textiles, tiles, brassware, jute, indeed, beady, indeed. diamond cutting, grain cut trading. These are all areas where A, a large number of people are casual daily wage labor, and B, this is all in the unorganized sector. This is where people will be suffering, and GDP statistics will not accurately reflect what happens to the yeah. lives of people. I mean, GDP statistics may well come down as one won't expect. 
But even if it didn't, it could hide the fact that the lives of people, lots of people, have been pretty badly roughed up. In fact, you used a very important word. A lot of the suffering of the poor and the daily casual labor could be hidden because statistics may not reflect it, but nonetheless, it's still real suffering. Yeah, yes, indeed. And the statistics will re reflect it, not the GDP statistics. We have to look at, uh, you know, their mortality, morbidity, uh, their, their other indicators of quality of life, on which I've been trying to write for some years Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Uh, now, in contrast, and maybe uh, in defense of his own uh, position, the finance minister says that, in fact, not only will government revenues through taxation go up substantially, although you did question that, but he also says that banks are flushed with cash as a result of which they'll be able to lend at lower interest rates, and that has begun happening. And thirdly, at some point, hopefully in the near future, the government will lower tax rates. Even if all of that happens, does it justify demonetization? It doesn't, but uh, you know, I think there are two issues here. I mean, uh, we're dealing with some of the cleverest people in India, namely Modi and Jaitley. So when they say something, there is some reasoning behind. And it's important to ask the question, what is the reasoning behind, even if you disagree with it? I think the reasoning may well be that from a revenue point of view, there will be some sort of success. It is possible that they could, I mean, that's not indicated at this time, but they, who knows, they may be right. And it's also possible that um, they may well be able to cut the taxes, which certainly when elections approach are always a good thing to do from the point of view of getting support. But none of that, that justifies the suffering we've been through. Support. But I want to raise one other issue also, if you will permit which me. Is? Which is this, that um, the, this is a policy which affected the lives of people in India and it affected the lives of the states. It was taken unilaterally by the center. And indeed, not even the whole of the central government, it was a very small group uh, with Modi around Modi. Now, the question that comes up at the state elections approach is that, is there an issue of federalism around here that we ought to address? In other words, should the government have consulted state governments? Because India is a federal polity, should the consultation have gone right across the federal uh, indeed, polity and, uh, rather than the central government? Yeah, I mean, indeed, that is a, a kind of question. Some of the, uh, like the Bengal finance minister Amit Mitra raised that issue. And I think it is, it is an important issue to raise, particularly in the context of, of, the, uh, of the present election. Because at the moment, can I come to that? Uh, I'll come to the chance? present election in a moment's time, but I think you've raised an important question, which is should the consultation have been wider, given that India is a federal polity? Should federal state governments have been consulted rather than the central government take this decision unilaterally on its own? It's a question that I'm going to leave deliberately hanging in the air. Let the audience think about it. I'm going to take a break, and when I come back, I'm going to raise with you the manner in which the RBI, a critical institution that has sole responsibility for currency in circulation, has conducted itself, whether you agree or disagree with some of the criticisms of the RBI that have been made, in particular with Mr. Chidharam. And finally, I want to ask you, how do you respond to the fact that despite the pain and suffering, the people of India still, in allegedly overwhelming numbers, support demonetization? Amartya Sen. Professor Sen, let's come to the RBI and the way, as an institution, it's behaved in connection with demonetization since November. What's your opinion of the RBI's behavior and attitude? Well, I, I'm not a, a radical in thinking about RBI's independence uh, role is, 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 should be uh, uh, one of the big things. It depends on who is being led. If it is being led by Manmohan Singh or, or Raghuram Rajan or I.G. Patel, uh, and I can think of a few others, yes, indeed, that they should have a major role. But if or it's not led by them? But then, you know, this is part of the government. RBI is not really detached from the rest of the government. So I don't weep around that the RBI is not, uh, not playing its big part. This is very interesting because in an article that he wrote on Sunday in the Indian Express, as well as in an interview he gave me last month, P. Chidambaram has been very strong in his criticism of Urujit Patel. He's even said that Mr. Patel, the present governor, has undermined the RBI's credibility. You're suggesting that that credibility as such never existed. It's always been part of the government. It has, well, it varied depending on who the governor is. You see, if you have uh, Manmohan or IG or Raghuram Rajan in that position, uh, you have to listen. The government 
whether or not formally uh, it, it has independent, it, you have to listen to that. In other words, it's not the RBI as an institution that has credibility, it's the individual who headed it who did. When a man like Raghuram Rajam or Manmohan Singh headed it, there was enormous credibility, but at other times, yeah. the RBI hasn't had that credibility. I, I, I will put it that way. Yes, and yes. therefore, you're not particularly perturbed by the way yeah, the RBI behaves. I can, I can no. understand the point that Chidam was making because having a really uh, excellent governor of RBI and his having or his or her having that independent is important. On the other hand, if you don't have such a good governor, uh, or I, I'm not saying anything about the present governor, I know nothing about him, uh, uh, then I, I don't think just as a general rule wanting independence of RBI and a voice, I, I I, I, I'm not turned on by that. Let's come to the political opposition, and in particular, I'm talking about the opposition to demonetization from Rahul Gandhi's Congress and Mamta Banerjee's Srinamul Congress. Arun Jaitley, in a blog that he did on Sunday, has said that these people have been more interested in disrupting parliament, and secondly, he says they've identified with black marketeers rather than side with the modernization of the Indian economy. Do you believe? that in fact the opposition has played a critical role in determining the way the country thinks about demonetization or have they simply whipped up a froth without achieving anything? Well, they have raised a very important question and made it inescapable for the government uh, to, uh, to have to say something on that. Uh, if, as we were discussing earlier, um, this is a federal decision that has been taken without uh, a, a kind of, um, uh, in a unitary mode. Now, I think the... Can I just point out that under the laws that pertain, the government has the right to respond to a request from the RBI to demonetize. They claim they got a request rather than asking the RBI to make that but request all, and then responded to it. I, first of all, I don't really believe that the request came from RBI. It is a government-oriented, central government-oriented, a decision on all accounts. And secondly, um, it, it's not so much whether they have a right to do it, whether they have a reason to do it is what we have to look at that. And that uh, you've already pointed out, they don't. I think the reasoning has been very loose. I'm but afraid. you're going one step forward, you're saying yeah. not just do they not have good reason to do it, morally, given that India is a federal policy, and given this would affect the states, the central government should have consulted the state governments and not exercised the decision unilaterally, even if they have the right to do it. Even if they have the right to yeah. do it, morally they should have consulted. Uh, there is a moral issue to which you rightly point, and that is there. There is a political issue also. Namely, most of the opposition parties, given the nature of India now, is a regional opposition. It comes from here, comes from there, and so on. Even Congress, which used to have an All India present, it's the one who comes closest to it, doesn't have it. So it's really often the regional point of view that you're getting. And I think it's very important in the present context that the opposition parties don't spend their time as they're doing Mulan versus uh, Achilles and so on, even within one party, and, 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 and a lot of others going on. And focus on this issue instead. Focus on the issue of this issue and the general issue of federalism in India. And if that is the case, then there is need for an oppositional unity, which would also make a major difference to the electoral outcome. But the important point you're making is that by taking the decision to demonetize unilaterally, the central government has adversely affected the federal character of India's polity and adversely affected the growth of federalism. And also, given the uh, state opposition, which really means opposition in India, good reason to think about what they can do by acting together rather than uh, trying to bite each other. One of the reasons why the, a policy which seems to be, as we have been discussing, so riddled with holes is still attracts uh, uh, a kind of positive respect for, from um, uh, Indian people. Is because the opposition to it is so fractured? It's so fractured. They're talking about a whole kinds of other things right now. And it's not just demonetization, it's the whole issue of what kind of a country is let India, me, is it me, a federal country? Let me end this interview by picking up on that last thought because it's a good way to end. We've discussed at great length the pain and suffering 
of demonetization. We've discussed and you've explained why you think it was the wrong way of achieving the aims it intends to achieve and why, in fact, it was the wrong policy. Yet, all the polls done show that 75% and more of the Indian people support demonetization. And these are the people who are actually suffering. These are the poor who are bearing the burden of it, but they support it. Yeah. Is that explicable or is it a paradox? Well, if they're all paradoxes are explicable, ultimately <laughs> they're a paradox until that moment. No, I think uh, they had a good explanation because I don't think, I think the opposition is fractured. Even in the, uh, the, the, the hullabaloo in the parliament that you refer to, there have been different uh, tensions. I think the whole issue of federalism has not been seized sufficiently. Uh, by the opposition? The, by the opposition. And so that the, in some ways, I mean, of course, Modi is, is a very good political leader, no question. And he can certainly make uh, people how think. Much, how much of uh, the public support in huge numbers for demonetization is a result of two things? One, trust in Mr. Modi because he has a way of convincing you he can deliver. And secondly, the hope, particularly amongst the poor, that this will tackle the bribery and corruption that has been the bane of their life. Are those two factors critical reasons why support at this moment remains high. It may not remain high forever, but at this moment it remains high. The second is definitely the case, I think, and it's very important and we to some extent discuss that. The first is the Modi magic would depend partly on how convincing the answer is. I mean, to take an analogy, if Napoleon were to say, after his attempted uh, raid on Russia, on his way back, that actually we didn't want to try to do anything in Russia, we wanted an excursion into some snowy mountains <laughs> in that area. I think it might have had difficulty. So, the A very interesting point. I'm going to stop you because I think it's an important thought to leave the audience. This is Mr. Modi's Napoleon moment. What we don't know is whether Mr. Modi in equivalent terms is on the way to Moscow with victory still possible ahead or whether he's on the retreat through bitter snow and a bedraggled army. That's the point at which the future we have to wait for, because <laughs> only the future will answer. I'm deeply grateful to you, Professor Sen, for helping us understand and analyze demonetization. A pleasure talking Thank to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.